Welcome to PS Summit 2021. And while we can't be together in person, I hope you're well. And I'm so glad that you've had time to join us. Hey, I'm Jason Helmick, a PM on the PowerShell team. And I'm joined today by my friend and total rock star, Damian Caro from the Azure PowerShell team. And I predict that you're going to like this. Um, Damian, by the way, wait a minute. Why are you joining me today? Hey, hi, everybody. Jason, I'm joining you because when we worked some time ago on PS Readline and Predictive Intelligence with Dynamic Help, we felt that Azure would be a great customer for this feature. Well, I think that's a perfectly good reason to, for us both to be here today. So basically, we want to show you some new features that we've been working on, Predictive IntelliSense, Dynamic Help, and what Damien's been working on with the AZ Tools Predictor. And I think, as I said, I predict you're going to like this. So let's go ahead and dive right in. First of all, the agenda slide, pretty straightforward agenda. PowerShell strives to help you be successful. More about that in a minute. Lots of demos. And we're going to talk about predictive IntelliSense dynamic help and the Azure PowerShell predictor, AZ Tools predictor. And you know, why wait? I'm just going to jump right into a quick demo. In fact, while I'm going to switch over to Windows right now to start this out, keep something in mind. Um, a major part to the success of PowerShell is that, well, PowerShell helps you be successful, and when you're successful, well, you want to keep repeating that experience. PowerShell and, and us working um, is kind of this symbiotic relationship that we have of success. And the idea is, we want to see if we can improve that. So let's start at the very beginning. You know what tab completion does, but let's take a quick look just to try it out real quick. So I'm going to I'm on the latest preview of PowerShell right now. I uh, hope you are too. I'm going to clear my screen and let's take a look at the old fashioned. I said old fashioned. I can't believe I said old fashioned, but let's take a look at tab completion. When you start typing a commandlet and you can just guess at what you might want. I think I might want something that begins with a C <laughs> as an example. Um, you can hit tab and tab will auto-complete this for you and show you commandlets that are matching the results that you've typed in. And you can hit shift tab and go backwards. The reason for this is there are thousands of commandlets out there and we want to help you. PowerShell wants to help you find what you're looking for. So when I start typing something like get PRO for get process, it will tab complete it. Also, when you're using parameters, you can use tab completion to complete the parameters. And I know that when you work with tab completion, a lot of us have trained our pinky finger to hang over that tab key, and it actually accelerates in completing a successful line for you to strike enter on. Well, more to it than that. See, we looked at that and we're like, ah, I wonder if there was some more help that we could do. I wonder if there's a way that we could help remind you not just of the commandlets and the parameters, but of entire commands, commands that you've already successfully completed, but maybe you forgot. I forget so many things. And also wanted to be able to help folks that maybe like me are a deeply flawed typist, and this could help accelerate your typing to success. So that's where predictive IntelliSense comes in. And I, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen other shells like the fish shell or Z shell, you may have seen some of their auto suggestions that appear very similar to this. Thought that was a really good idea. So what predictive IntelliSense actually is, is that it's an addition to tab completion. It assists you in completing your commands. This enables an experience. Advanced users, they get accelerated. And what I hope you're going to see out of this, especially when Damien is showing off the AZ Tools predictor, is that for newer users, it helps teach them how to use the commandlets and be successful in completing whatever their goals were. So let me show you a little bit about predictive IntelliSense. First of all, where do I find predictive IntelliSense? Well, here's what you need. I'm on the latest preview of PowerShell right now, but as I'm going to show you in a slide, predictive IntelliSense works on PowerShell 7 up, all the way up at where we're at now, and it even works down level. So what you're looking for, if you want to enjoy this experience, is you're looking for, it would help if I could type it, <laughs> 
there's a reason why I'm having a hard time typing is because I don't have my predictions turned on yet. So you can find the module. You can, let me use the tab key. There we go. Allow pre-release. I'm going to let this run. When you find that, you're going to find our current uh, beta release 2.2 beta 2 of PS Readline. That's all you need for the features that I'm going to show you. Now, when you install the new version of PS Readline and start your shell up, you're not going to notice any changes. It's going to work the same way that you expect it to turn on the experience of having a historical predictive IntelliSense, you do that by, well, you can do this in your profile or you can do it right here at the prompt. And yes, I'm gonna give you notes on this, but you set PS read line option and you type prediction source. And there are three options here. You can do none, you can do history, and that's what I'm going to start with. So I'm going to leave this here. Or you can do something called history and plug-in, and we'll save that one for a little bit. So as soon as I set PS read line, prediction source history, that will enable it. Now it's going to start to use your history file. Now I want to kind of pause here for a second and, and then say, look, I know a lot of you have used like get history. Get history pulls up your session history, stuff that you've done in that current shell. PS Readline has its own history file, and this history file records all your history across all of your sessions. That's the history that we use for the predictions. That's much more usable because it, well, it lasts a lot longer, right? So take a look. As I start to type now, I'm going to get a prediction. I'm going to start to type get child item, and you might, if you look really closely, squint your eyes, you might see a faint gray ghost image giving me a prediction. Now look, I know that this is hard for you to see, so I'm gonna change the color of this. And I wanna just tell you that this is one of the points. You may not like this color on your screen. It's almost impossible for you to see in this video. Um, so I want you to know that you can change these colors of predictions to anything that you like. In fact, let me just grab one right here. Oh, you know what? I might be kind of lucky I could grab one of my favorite ones. Well, this isn't my favorite one. Let me grab Steve's favorite one. And yes, I'm going to just paste this right here. So you can set the colors also in your profile. And I'm going to give you more notes on that. But this happens to be Steve Lee's favorite pr uh, uh, prediction color. And let me just show you what it does. As I start to type, you're going to see a prediction. See that pop up and see how it's kind of highlighted? It's a lot like the browser that you use when you go in and you type in, in, into your browser. So you can change these colors. Now I'm going to set this to my favorite color. And my favorite color is green because I like to, let me get back here and change this. My favorite color is green. So when I start to type, see, I get this positive affirmation that I'm doing the right thing. And if you take a look at my screen, you're going to see that it's predicting this for me from my history. As I was typing get child item, it says, hey, I found this thing called get child item in your history. Would you like to accept that? And I can either just keep typing or I can choose to accept that. And I'm going to accept it with my right arrow key. And when I accept that prediction, well, that really accelerated me. If this is what I wanted to do, I can hit enter. And it does exactly what I wanted. So I'm going to clear the screen and show you that I can, as I'm typing, it'll give me predictions. I want to show you something else. The view that you're seeing on the screen right now is what we call inline view. Your predictions are inline, and this is very similar to what you may see in fish shell or Z shell. And this is the normal way or the preferred way that I usually like to use things, but that's not always the case. We have another view for you that you might find even more useful. And this is when I'm going to press the F2 key. And so take a look at my prediction right now. You can see that I've typed get-ch, and now I'm going to press F2, and instead of this inline view, I'm going to get a list view. What the list view does is it shows you all of the top hits from your history. In this case, you can see on the right side of my screen, shows you that this is coming from the history predictive plugin, and it gives me a list of options that it may have found, and I can arrow down and select those options and you can see it displays across and I can strike enter at any time and just yep that's what I wanted so you've got two views that you can work with whichever view is most comfortable with you I find myself switching between those I usually start and work with things like I'm doing a lot of get stuff right um, so I'll do get and it'll predict for me but a lot of times when I'm doing get stuff I forget 
the get commands that I want to use. So what I can do is hit F2 and go, oh, that's what I wanted. Yeah, I wanted to, to fetch something or clone something. So this helps me take a look at a list of what I've done in my history and see something that I might want to grab and work with. Now, here's the other best part. You can move through these lines, you can edit these lines, and as you edit these, your predictions may change. Now, for an advanced user that's already done something successfully, this can be very helpful, having all of this in your history. It's a quick way to look things up. But you know, we this experience, we weren't quite done with this. We I love this historical predictor, and it saves me a lot of time. In fact, you, you kind of notice when I, at first when I had it turned off, I can barely type at all now because I'm so used to having this predictor help me out and accelerate me. But we wanted to add something else, and I want to show it to you now, and then I'm going to give you some notes on this. But, oh, you know what? Instead of just diving right in, let me show you a couple of other things about predictor. In other words, I'm screwing up. I'm moving too fast. So let me slow down for a second and show you a couple of other things. I'm sure this question is on your mind. Well, this is nice on Windows, but does it work on Linux or Mac? Well, let me switch back over to here and pop up my terminal on my Mac. And uh, you can see I'm running our latest preview on, on my Mac. And I'll just start typing. And lo and behold, you'll see that, yep, it works. The predictors work just fine. Um, and you can see that it, it runs. Let me clear. Let me start typing again. And I can have list view. So I got both views, inline view, list view. You can see I've got a lot more samples on my Mac because I spent a lot of time uh, working here. <laughs> so it works on Mac. It works on Windows. Does it work on Windows PowerShell 5.1? Well, here's Windows PowerShell 5.1. And I'll start typing, and you can see that it works here, including, I'll go back, type, and, yep, you get list view. So this experience will work for you even down level on, on Windows PowerShell, on PowerShell 7 on Windows, and PowerShell 7 on Linux or Mac. Can I get a yay? I mean, that's a huge yay, right? It works cross-plot. That's awesome. Okay, okay. Now on to some of the other features. First of all, let's uh, take a look at the slides here, see how I'm doing. Let me get this guy out of the way. And a couple of notes for you on predictions. First of all, as I said, this is available for PowerShell 7 on Windows, on Mac, and Linux, and it's available on PowerShell 5.1. You can download this as PS Reline 2.2 Beta 2, and there's a blog with the announcement and additional notes, basically everything that I'm showing to you. You do need to enable these predictions, or you will see nothing. So make sure that you enable them. And I put this right into my profile. Um, in fact, I can even show you my profile in a little bit. Um, and some of the options are none, history, and history and plugin. You'll see history and plugin in just a minute. And you get two views that you can switch by pressing F2. Also, I wanted to make sure that you had notes, and we're going to give you these slides as well so that you can change the color. And I'm giving you a couple of examples here that you can set the color. And there's more examples in the documentation. Now, for another new feature in PS Read Line called Dynamic Help. Now, it just so happens that when I think about PowerShell helping me be successful, predictions, that really accelerates me. But one of the other challenges is, is that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of commandlets, and I'm never going to remember more than three of them, right? You know, get help, get command, get member. So other than those three, there's a lot of time I need some help uh, when I'm working in PowerShell. So let me give you an example. A lot of times you can do this. You just do get help and you do uh, whatever commandlet that you like. And you know how this routine goes, dash full. Well, this is nice, but when I'm actually working on something, you know, I'm trying to work on, and let me go to inline view. I'm trying to write something. If I have to stop and go back and now type get help, that's a painful experience. So what a lot of people have a tendency to do is they'll open up multiple terminals or multiple consoles, and you flip between them. Or you can go to the online help, and then you got a terminal and a browser, and you're bouncing around, and you're searching and all that. We wanted to make this whole process just a tiny bit easier and see if, um, you know, we could make this easier. 
And I'm flipping my screen around for some reason. It's going all over the place. Let me go back here. I'm actually having a slight technical difficulty. Let me do one thing to get my mouse pointer back. There we go. I got my mouse pointer back. I'm so much happier now. So let me show you this experience of dynamic help. I'm going to start to type just as I would. And I'm going to, you know what? I need help with this command light. I'm going to press F1. Here's what's happening. We just went to an alternative screen buffer. The screen buffer is showing me the full help for get child item. I can arrow up and arrow down so I can read the help. But I really want you to notice the Q key down here to quit because when I quit, it takes me right back to where I was working. And I'm going to continue typing here. And I'm going to go dash path. You know what? I forgot what that parameter does. I can press F1. And notice what it does. It goes right to the parameter help for that parameter. So you don't have to scroll through it. But even more interesting, watch what happens when I hit Q. It takes me right back to where I was working. So the use of this alternative screen buffer is very, very helpful. So you can get help anytime you want. In fact, let me show you a trick. I do this all the time. Did you guys ever do this? Do you folks ever do this where you do like get help and you'll start to type something and you'll be like, yeah, just find everything that begins with a C because you're not sure what the name was and you just wanted to start to, to look around and, and, and peruse a little bit. You can do the same thing now, only you don't have to type get help. So if I do get space C and now I press F1, boom, there we go. So, and I can hit Q, go right back to where I was working, anywhere in the pipeline. So this dynamic help is a faster way for you to get help when you need help, but wait, there's more. Of course there's more. Some of my favorite features with dynamic help, let me show you, is I've got a favorite one here. I'm going to go to a parameter, and I want you to notice that my cursor is at the end of a completed parameter name, and I'm going to hit a key combination, Alt-H, and I think of Alt-H, H is for help. And what it does is it pops up just a short version of the parameter help. When you do this over the parameter, Alt-H works for parameters. And it basically tells you, you know, a short description of what the parameter does and does it accept pipeline input. A lot of times when I'm working in a pipeline, that's the only information I need to know. So I can hit Alt-H and make it go away and then continue on with my work. But my favorite feature, and I think this is one that's probably helped me the most besides getting, besides being able to get help right here and, and, and quickly navigate through things is Alt-A. And I think of A as arguments. A lot of times when I'm accepting a prediction, like I have on the screen, I could have picked a longer one, but you get the idea. When I've accepted a prediction, sometimes the arguments to the parameters are what I want to change. Well, I don't want to be bouncing my cursor all over the place, so I can just hit Alt-A. Alt-A takes you right to the arguments so you can quickly change them. I don't know what to change this path to, but you get the idea. So dynamic help is combining with predictive IntelliSense. You get the predictions, you can accept the predictions, you can edit the predictions, and dynamic help will help you quickly edit the arguments, get some help, maybe on a commandlet that you forgot or a parameter that you forgot. And that's kind of the experience that we're working towards is not only accelerate experienced users that have a bunch of stuff loaded already up in their history, but to help inexperienced users. Maybe you're working with some commandlets you haven't worked with before. Maybe you're newer to PowerShell and you need a little bit of extra help to be successful. Get that help quicker and easier. Oh. By the way, most important note of all, now that you can get help right when you're typing, guess what you're going to want to do? This is my tip of the day. Update your help. But by the way, if you're saying, oh, I've updated help and it doesn't update anything, I'm with you. We've been working on it. We've been fixing it. So updatable help now works for all of the PowerShell content, and we're working on with other teams to update their help as well. So make sure you update your help, dash force, and this experience with dynamic help will be much better. Now, a couple of quick notes. Let me go back to the slides here on dynamic help. A couple of things. Again, all you need to do is download PS Reline 2.2 Beta 2. Same thing that you needed for predictions. This also works down level to Windows PowerShell 5.1. How cool is that? Um, just to let you know, a couple of little notes. 
When the cursor is at the end of a fully expanded commandlet, then you can press F1. I know it gets a little confusing with predictions. Sometimes you start typing and you're like, I'm going to hit F1 right here. Remember, that's going to search for what you've just typed in so far. If you want help for a commandlet, completely type it in, then press F1. Same thing for a parameter. And don't forget about Alt-H and the Alt-A keys. Now, a couple of things I want to point out to you, and I'll even demonstrate some of this. I've been talking about these Alt-H and Alt-A keys. Um, if you're interested in what uh, shortcuts you can use with PS ReadLine, all of PS ReadLine, whether it be predictions or dynamic help, there's a great article on Docs I've given you a link to that discusses all of the functions that you could change and the key bindings that you could change if you wanted to and put them into your PowerShell profile. A little note that I want to give you. If you're a Mac user, the Alt key combinations don't work really well for you right now. And so one of the things you're going to want to do is rebind those to some other key combination so that you can use the experience that you would have with Alt H and Alt A. What I've done is, first of all, I wanted to give you a note on the slide that there is an issue already about this. And if you want to come and, and add some more comments to this issue, if you have some ideas on how to fix it, join us and, and discuss it with us. But also, I wanted to show you that in your profile, you can set a PS ReadLine key handler and change those, those key bindings. And I've given you the ones that I've changed it to. So while I'm demonstrating this, telling you you used Alt-H and Alt-A, I'm sitting here trying to hit the control keys. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. You can remap these, and you can remap anything in PS ReadLine, and you can do that all again in your PowerShell profile. So, and interestingly enough, this slide intentionally left blank. I think, Damien, this is where I'm supposed to shut up and hand it over to you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give it over to you. Hey, thanks, Jason. Um, so it's a perfect transition because when we started to talk about it, I remember uh, some months ago, I said, what you're building is really good and in the Azure world, we could actually benefit from, from that ability to help customers be more efficient, be uh, more agile in how they write PowerShell code with Azure. And, and that's how we, we went further and understood a bit better what customers, our customers, the Azure PowerShell customers were looking for. Um, not only we had those feedbacks that we heard from now and from now and then about the name of the functions being uh, complicated, being long, difficult to remember, uh, because when we were building those commandlets, we tried always to find the balance between the length of the command and how intuitive and how natural it would be for someone to get. Um, and and that was always a complicated exercise, but but then with predictive intelligence built for Azure PowerShell, we find there is a better way to actually address the problem. Not that we're going to remove the exercise, but it makes it easier for us to find something that makes sense, considering that predictor can help getting there. Um, the other thing that we, that we were doing, we were doing, and we are still doing on a regular basis, usability studies. And those usability studies <clears throat> is a way for us to observe uh, what customers are doing. And it turns out that when you have something like 4,000 commandlets or more today, the tab completion doesn't bring that much value. Um, the, the one you're describing at the very beginning of the session, it, it doesn't have that value that you have when you have, let's say, 100 of those commandlets. So you basically have to almost type the entire entirety of the commandlet to get there. Um, and, and the other thing that we've observed is it's very easy to mistype a, 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 a letter into the, the command that you're typing, you make typos in every now and then, and then it's com cumbersome when you have to switch between what the command is doing and the help online to understand what are the values of the parameters, what are the types that are expected for each parameter. So most of our customers ended up having a screen with the commandlet reference document while they're typing the code so they can actually be successful with that command. That being said, um, <clears throat> we, we came with this easy predictor um, 
that aims at helping um, or addressing those problems. And not only does the suggestion of what would be the next commandlet to use, uh, but it also is what we call context aware. Uh, by that I mean we understand the Azure context, but we also understand what are the resources and the features that have been used previously, uh, like the resource group. And, and we wanted to make it easier for people when they're typing um, to have that information already in the command that is proposed. Uh, I will show you that in a demo just in a minute um, to, to show you exactly how it looks. But I want to conclude that slide by saying that it's really bringing the help to the developer's fingertip or the PowerShell developer's fingertip while being useful for anyone with any level of experience. And I'm really thinking that it can help someone that is totally beginner in Azure PowerShell world, as well as someone that has years of experience and knows the command perfectly well, still there is value in that by reducing the number of keys you're typing, being more efficient at the end of the day in running those commands. But um, I'm like Jason, I like to show things. <laughs> and, uh, and let's do a, a quick demo on, on this. So, I am currently with my um, Azure PowerShell environment setup. You see I'm running a preview of uh, 7.2. I also have PS Readline uh, preview installed and I have the AZ Tools Predictor module installed. And we'll come to that in a minute, how you install and how you get it. But um, once you have your AZ Predictor module installed, there is a thing that is important to understand. It's a module that doesn't have any commandlets by nature. It is um, present with uh, just two commandlets. And if you don't enable the predictor, the predictor is going to be installed, but it's not going to be available for you. So you have to enable, and I'm typing at the same time, AZ um, predictor, and you see, uh, I love, <laughs> I love the <laughs> predictive intelligence that is taking that information from my history. And you run that command, enable AZ predictor dash all session. And that command is going to ensure that we are loading the AZ predictor module every time you run your PowerShell sessions. And that we're enabling the history uh, and the plugin, uh, the prediction from history and plugin. You remember, Jason, you mentioned that we were talking, getting the histories, uh, with yeah. the prediction from the history. We can also have the plugin, and that's what we're doing here. We're combining the history and the plugin together. So once you run that, what we're doing is basically we're updating the profile, your PowerShell profile, to ensure that that module is being loaded every single time, and that the predictions come from plugins and history. Now that we have that, I'm going to do a new, and because in the Azure world we, had, we have those words, those, those verbs, new, set, remove, update, uh, that are very common. So I'm going to create a resource group. And you see on the command right now with predictive intelligence, I am proposed to have a new AZ resource group with the name RG1 and location East US. That sounds pretty good so far. So I'm going to accept that with just the right row. And now I'm going to navigate through the values so I can adjust the value. So what those values come, where do those values come from? The values come from the examples we have. So we've built the predictor based on the, on the samples we have on the reference doc for Azure PowerShell. Now the name of a resource group doesn't, meet, doesn't fit any, everyone. So I'm going to change that to AZ predictor. And you see, as I'm typing, there's a new parameter that showed up at the very end. And that comes from the context awareness that we have with that prediction. The That's last cool. one is the tag, and it retrieves the tag value from previous commands I've been using. A best practice is to tag your resources with the owner. That's how we do it in our team. Uh, and that's actually good information to keep in mind. So let's accept that. All right. So 
I'm going to create a resource group. Fairly simple, fairly straightforward. I mean, I guess everyone who has been in Azure has done that at one point. But now I'm going to switch my environment and I'm going to switch to the list view. And as much as the inline view is interesting and, 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 and sweet to use, I'm more the list view type of person. And I know we had that conversation many times together, Jason. Um, yes, we have. <laughs> so what would I do after I create a resource group? Well, I'm going to let the predictor tell me what are the most likely type of resources that I should be doing right now. And I'm going to zoom for a second here. You are the zoom it master. Yes. So the first entries, the first three entries here, are coming from my history. And the next ones are coming from our predictor API. So when the predictor module is loaded, it talks to our background API to understand what are the, the, the commandlets to execute or what are the commandlets that you're likely going to run after that. The first one that is presented is a resource group deployment, um, which is not really what I was considering for this demo. I was considering something more like a storage account or something like that. So let's go again to our command and see how that list of prediction is evolving as I'm typing through those, um, those, those characters. Z, and let's say I remember it's a storage account. Here it is. And the predictor shows those different options with, starting with S, SQL Server, Service Bus, etc. Storage account sounds pretty good to me. And you see that prediction not only is coming from the AZ predictor, and that's how you know if it's a history prediction or if it's a predictor prediction or AZ predictor prediction. But it has also name of a resource, sorry, the name of a resource group pre-populated um, pre coming from the previous command I have created, uh, I've run before, AZ predictor. And the name of the storage account, AZ predictor123, well, it takes it from previous um, previous trial that I've done to prepare this demo. And, and since the model has been in my environment, it keeps that information and suggests that I use this value. Um, since I know I've been using it and it works, I'm going to go there and, and run that command. So Damien, let me ask you this real quick. So basically, while you're in this session, if you've used a value like the, the name of a resource group, when you use other commands, it pre-populates those values that you've already used to help accelerate you even further and so you don't have to do all that typing again. That is correct. When you're writing a script, you would use uh, a variable <clears throat> or when you run your command, you would use a variable and it will use the variable the same way it would use the value. It doesn't, AZ predictor doesn't care if it's something that you've typed as a string or as a variable. It would just use what you have used before so at the end of the day, yes, it, it, it facilitates and accelerates how you're running those commands. Um, I'm going to type enter because it takes a couple of seconds to run. Um, the values that we have here, uh, so location, resource group name, and the name of a resource come from the history. The other values like SKU name, storage here, and the default values for hierarchical namespace or HTTP traffic only are coming from the examples that we have in our reference docs. So going forward, when we evolve those examples in the reference doc, the values that are pre-populated here will evolve as well. If you think of virtual machines, for example, the default SKU name, uh, as we're evolving, the SKU name may also change in the in the pro, uh, suggestion that is being made uh, right now in the easy predictor. <clears throat> um, I could run that command multiple times and then we can do more, like now we can see what would be the next thing to do. And easy predictor would say, well, <clears throat> maybe you want to do a service view queue or resource deployment again and rule definition, etc. And those are evolving over time as you are going through your journey and creating resources. <clears throat> so now there is one thing. When we when we have those predictions, we need to know 
what you have done so we can help predict what is going to be the next command to run. And, and comes usually a question here is, how do you know that? What do you use to get those predictions? Um, what we're doing in the PowerShell world, Azure PowerShell world, we know the parameter sets that are used for each command when you run those. And that's technically what we are sending to the API to understand what are the next value or the next probable command that are going to run. We're not sending any parameters um, there. We're just sending the parameter set name, the, the values of the, the name of the parameters, not the values of them. And to show you exactly how that works, I've been running Fiddler under the hood uh, since the oh, beginning of this session. This is cool. So you're running Fiddler to show what traffic is going to the the server side API, right? And 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 as you've just pointed out, you're not sending any argument values. So there's no PII that's going to get sent. Is that what you're you're pointing out? That is correct. There is no PII, no secret, no technically there are no values that we're sending. We're only sending information about the command being used and the parameters that are used with that command. Any well, value got, is removed before it actually sent anywhere. You got Fiddler open, prove it. <laughs> so, exactly. So I was looking at the um, at different requests that we are sending with our API. And if we look at the one we did before the resource group, uh, after the when we, sorry, at the one that we use when we send the resource group, we have the history information here, and that's what is being sent to our API. We have in the get is subscription, which is the one I was running before we started the demo, <laughs> uh, to verify I was using the right subscription. And you see we don't have any subscription ID or anything being sent. We have the new easy resource group command that is being executed, but the location value, the name value, the tag value are totally removed. We just replaced them with three stars. That's what we're sending to our API. As a response, the API returns um, the four or five commandlets that are likely going to be used. And, and you see, they are generic commands, so they come from what our examples are. Uh, so we have the command and the description. Um, the description, we're not using it so far, we're just looking at the command, but we believe maybe at one point we may want to use the description somehow. Uh, so we're sending it in our API. <clears throat> the command has values, as you can see here, coming from our example. <clears throat> and when the predictor retrieves that command, it overwrites the value of the resource group name in that example from Contoso Engineering to be in the example we've been doing, is a predictor. So at the end of the day, what you have is a value that makes sense for your session, but that value has never left your environment. That's awesome. Um, so, and if you want to run Fiddler, you just look for it, you attach to your PowerShell session, and you can see what are the exchange being done between your local environment and, and the API that we're using. Um, it's very straightforward, basically. Uh, on how it works, but I thought it was interesting to show a bit of the uh, secret sauce behind the scene, how we communicate to our API, uh, to give you a better understanding on, on how it works. And there is like no real magic here. Well, and the thing is, Damien, I think that's you know the the most commonly asked question that I get is uh, this the the ML based predictor, the AZ tools predictor. Um, what are you sending up to the server? And and the answer is well nothing other than, you know, what we need to know in order to make the prediction. We're not taking any of your arguments, any of that. That all happens locally within your session, as you pointed out. I think that's a, you know, real important point. So um, by using this, you're actually helping to teach the predictor to get better this way because we're letting you talk to that server. And so there's a lot of benefits to this. <clears throat> exactly. As, <clears throat> as every uh, machine learning model it evolves over time with more data that we can uh, have. And, and the more people are going to use it, the better it's going to be. Uh, so that's why 
uh, I'm asking as many people as possible to try the predictor. Um, we have on ak.ms slash easy predictor the steps to go through to install it, the requirements like the previews for PowerShell uh, and PS Suite line. I just want to emphasize that whatever you're going to build with easy predictor, if for Azure PowerShell, has to be on PowerShell. Uh, you have to use PowerShell 7 to preview to use AZ Predictor. But the script you're doing can actually run on other versions of PowerShell. AZ PowerShell is cross-platform, and, and we've made sure that all those commands run on down level versions of PowerShell. So that's important to make sure that you can build and develop your environment in 7.2, but still be compatible on previous version of PowerShell. I really want to say, give it a try. <laughs> try it and, and share your feedback. <laughs> we have a survey, so we, we are very much into that phase where we have a preview and, and we have the ability to make adjustments. Um, and the more we hear some feedback, the better we will be. So the survey is important to feel when you run the predictor for maybe a day or so, and then fill the survey so you can tell us what you think about it. Um, the main issue is the run the enable easy predictor slash or se dash or session because we've seen customers who've been trying it and they say it doesn't work and it's likely because they haven't enabled the predictors. So run the command, make sure you run it. And I just wanted to say a bit where we're going with that. <laughs> 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 because it's exciting, we have we have a couple of things that are coming. Uh, the first one is integration with VS Code. Uh, so we're working uh, to make sure that we have at some point, uh, we don't have a firm timeline so at this time, so that's why I'm very vague on the timeline, but we want to have an integration in the VS Code extension uh, to bring that experience in, in your development environment. And, and we're going to have another preview by the four time frame. Yeah, let me just kind of jump in and, and, and say that uh, uh, when it comes to a VS Code and VS Code extension and getting predictions into it, um, as Damien mentioned, we are investigating this right now. We get this as a question all the time. One of our challenges is we need to make sure that the predictions are working correctly. And so that's why we would really like for you to try this out and give us some feedback on it um, as we start to look at putting it into VS Code. To let, um, just so that you know what's coming up in front of us, we've just started that investigation and we're working with Sydney Smith, um, who uh, uh, handles the VS Code extension. And we should have a design issue up in the VS Code extension GitHub um, probably in the next couple of weeks or by the time you see this video, we'll publicly start talking about it and talking about some of the ideas of how we are gonna try to get it in. We're not making any commitments yet, um, this is an early investigation, but we'd like to see if we can we can do this and we want to kind of let you in on the inside. And we could use your feedback on that design issue as we move forward in this. And yes, Damien pointed out, look to his next preview. It's so exciting. <clears throat> so Jason, oh, hey. you want to uh, wrap up yeah. everything on the resources? Well, sure. Resources and feedback. and. And first of all, folks, thanks so much for taking the time to to join Damien and I today. It, we really, really, both Damien and I were talking about this. We really we, uh, can't look forward enough to the day when we get to to uh, once again be able to do this in person and be able to talk to you inside and outside of the the the, the sessions um, for predictive and cell sense and dynamic help. We hope that these features that we've been adding to PS Readline are helpful, and that's why we really want your feedback. We want to know if you're running into any problems or if you have some suggestions on how we might be able to improve the experience. I know that I've already got somebody pinging me going, hey man, the up arrow, down arrow, and dynamic help, can you make that page up and page down? So yes, we have an issue and, and we'll work on that. So come out, tell us what you think. Remember, the idea behind this is to accelerate you from your history, if you've already been successful. And a lot of us have found this to be a great accelerator. Also, with the inclusion of dynamic help and predictors like the Azure Tools predictor, we also want to be able to help people learn new commandlets or people that are newer to PowerShell to be more successful as they work with it. Again, make sure if you get a chance, please check out the AZ predictor. 
let us know how we can improve that. And I, I just want to say, and, and Damien, I, I have to thank you so much for um, working with us, the, the PowerShell team directly um, on this predictor. It's been amazing to work with you, and I really enjoy uh, uh, the directions that we're heading. And I want to thank everybody here for PowerShell Summit 2021. Make sure you have a chance to stop by. Check out State of the Shell. Check out all of the sessions that the team's doing. Check out all of the sessions that are going on here and get that information that you need so that you can be more effective when you get back to the office. Thanks so much. And have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Have a great day.